Have you ever looked at aspirin and thought to yourself that those pills would be excellent glow sticks? I certainly have wondered about that. And therefore I will try if we can actually pull this off. The main ingredient in glow sticks is a chemical called TCPO. The active ingredient in aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. On the first glance these molecules look completely different apart from the benzene ring. But to a chemist molecules are like Lego. You can turn anything into anything. Replace a piece there, connect a new one here and boom, you reach your target molecule. I want to try the synthesis as I believe that it will be a fun little challenge using a multitude of reagents. To start off I went to the pharmacy and bought some of that sweet sweet aspirin. And now that I got the aspirin, let's see what I can do. Let's go! I ended up acquiring 200 tablets containing 500 mg of acetyl salicylic acid each. This means I have a total of 100 grams of aspirin to work with. Unfortunately, as with all things in life, it's not that easy. Tablets are never made from pure active ingredient. They contain something called filler, which in this case is a mix of microcrystalline cellulose and starch. To get rid of them, I am going to do a solvent extraction with a suitable solvent. In this case you cannot use water as it would dissolve the aspirin very poorly. Acetone fortunately seems to be the ideal choice. It dissolves our target molecule well and I can easily get rid of leftover solvent. I generously added a few milliliters of acetone, covered the beaker to limit evaporation and then threw in a small stirfish to speed up the process. It was stirred for 2 hours and then I dumped in more acetone as it was too little before. 2 hours later we were left with a cloudy solution with no traces of intact tablets inside. I then did a simple vacuum filtration to get rid of the filler which stayed behind in the filter. The filler was rinsed once with acetone to make sure no aspirin stays behind. This step does not take long and I can increase the yields by doing this. Now that the waste cocaine was filtered off there's a beautiful clear solution of product. I waited a little too long and as acetone evaporated I observed this fascinating crystal formation. Nobody's going to notice. Yeah. <laughs> Acetone has a low boiling point of only 56 degrees Celsius. I can thus easily distill it off with a simple distillation. As the boiling point is relatively low, you can touch the apparatus without burning your fingers. I always enjoy watching the vapor front climbing up the glass and seeing the first drops dribbling into the flask. The entire distillation took less than an hour and left us with a solid mass of white product. This white rock contains a tiny amount of leftover acetone. It would not matter for further processing, but if I want to determine the yield, it needs to be removed. Blowing air onto it while warm is more than enough. I used an aquarium pump and blasted funny atmospheric gas onto it at 80 degrees Celsius. Three hours later, the smell of acetone had completely disappeared. In the end, I got 98.1 grams of product and this time the math is easy, it's also 98.1% yield. In the next step I will turn the acetyl salicylic acid into a simpler chemical. We do not need that acetyl part, so I need to remove it to get salicylic acid. For this step I am going to use the extracted acetyl salicylic acid, sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. As acetyl salicylic acid is an ester it can easily be split into two parts. To do this I added 50 grams of sodium hydroxide to the flask followed by quickly pouring in water. The amount of sodium hydroxide used is a small excess. The reaction taking place is called a basic ester hydrolysis or also saponification. Acetyl salicylic acid itself is turned into its corresponding salt in the first step. For this reason equimolar amounts of sodium hydroxide are worthless and you need at least 2 moles of hydroxide per mole of aspirin. I continued by setting up a reflux because unless you want to wait literal decades for the reaction to take place you need heat.
Underheating, sodium acetate is split off and I am left with the sodium salt of salicylic acid. If you want to take a closer look at the exact mechanism, you can pause now. I am still not finished. The sodium salt needs to be turned into the free acid. By adding an excess of a stronger acid, such as hydrochloric acid, free salicylic acid can be precipitated. I used about 120 milliliters of 33% HCl. As the acid was carefully added, the product instantly crashed out in the form of a white mess. Everything needs to react and as you can see our stirfish is having a really hard time and I am definitely not going to give it a break. I absolutely did not want to lose out on potential product and therefore let it stir for an hour to ensure all sodium salicylate reacts with HCl. Again, the trusted vacuum filtration is the best way to remove any liquid. I quickly rinsed the filter cake with distilled water too, before scraping it onto a highly specialized laboratory tray that was made by a cutting open a canister. I used a small filter and eventually it's going to be full. After emptying it, I therefore repeated the same process. And there you go, some of world's finest Colombian powder with a little bit of dihydrogen monoxide contamination. For removing the hydroxyl acid, I decided to put the plastic tray into a vacuum chamber over an hydrous calcium chloride. A vacuum may not be necessary, but with a vacuum the product will be dry faster than a chemist falling into rage after over titrating. My vacuum pump ended up breaking and as the chamber is not perfectly airtight, it filled back up within a day. I also did not want to wait weeks for it to dry, so it will be used while wet for the next step. When you look closely, you can see condensation on the wall of the flask. I didn't even determine the yield as there was 126.1 grams of wet powder and this means there's still a lot of water in it. With a bent glass pipe I connected it to another flask. I tried this before and used the condenser last time, which was a big mistake. Last time the condenser clogged up, leading to overpressure, a stopper flew out of the flask and the entire room got filled with nasty phenol vapor. To get rid of a fraction of residual water, I first connected a small flask and later changed it out for a bigger one. When salicylic acid is heated, a reaction called a decarboxylation takes place. Decarboxylation means that carbon dioxide is split off. In the case of salicylic acid, the decarboxylation is going to yield phenol. To make sure the phenol condenses efficiently and does not leave through the tube, I put my most trusted fan next to the flask. A water bath like this would also work, but that would mean 5 extra minutes of work for me and my laziness does not allow that. More water came over before the reaction flask got hot enough, but once the decarboxylation began and phenol started forming, I observed this interesting effect. The phenol cools down in the air, crystals form and you get this mesmerizing effect. It's like a snow globe in a round bottom flask. The entire decarboxylation took about 2 hours and in the end we were left with a decent amount of phenol. Some also escaped through the tube, but that tiny amount does not really matter. As I took a closer look at the flask, I noticed that there was solid floating around. I guess I didn't wash the salicylic acid well enough and this could be sodium chloride. Once the phenol generation ceased and there was only solid left in the flask, I turned off the heating mantle and took the flask out of it to avoid getting any burn marks. Here it's obvious how much leftover water there is, because literal layers are visible. Fortunately, the next reaction step involving phenol will have additional water added and therefore I don't care. In the flask we were left with 119.7 grams of the purest phenol the world has ever seen. There's another part of the preparation that's not directly related to the phenol and for that I need an hydrous oxalic acid. But I only have to dehydrate, so we need to dry it. For drying you could use a water trap and reflux with toluene, but there's a much better method. This, this is a drying pistol. You put your oxalic acid in here, let steam pass through here and connect another flask with a drying agent over here. This way you can obtain an hydrous oxalic acid without having to remove toluene afterwards and this is a win-win. 
you are going to see this amazing piece of equipment in action in a few seconds and then the working mechanism should become obvious. This is the only step of today's synthesis that requires absolutely zero calculation. Having an hydrous oxalic acid around never hurts and therefore I filled the drying pistol as much as possible. As it turns out I ended up filling the drying pistol with 79.8 grams of oxalic acid dihydrate. As a drying agent I use the hydrous calcium chloride as it is cheap and works well. A drying pistol operates under a vacuum. If you want it to work at all, the ground glass joints must be greased appropriately. Of course I could use fancy fluorinated laboratory grease, but the Vaseline jar was standing closer to me and it's not inferior to the fancy stuff. I filled up the flask and the heating mantle using distilled water. Water vapor with its temperature of 100 degrees C is the ideal temperature for drying oxalic acid. After setting up a reflux so the water doesn't leave the system, I connected the flask and pulled the vacuum. Heating and stirring were turned on and as the water vapor travels through the mantle of the drying pistol, the oxalic acid heats up and releases the two molecules of water per molecule of oxalic acid. Due to the vacuum, water boils off at a lower temperature and it also goes into the cold part of the drying pistol more easily, where it gets sucked up by the desiccant. 91 minutes and 3.5 seconds in, no more water came over. I stopped the process and weighed out the oxalic acid. I certainly didn't spill any. While taking a last look at the desiccant before throwing it away, I see that it looks decently wet. The most OTC source for red phosphorus are striker pads, so I got one box. Or maybe some more. To remove the red phosphorus from the striper strip, I added acetone and then scraped it off using a sharp object. I did this with 10 boxes of matches and if you are wondering, the match heads are worthless. They don't contain red phosphorus, but a mix of potassium chlorate, sulfur and a binder. I ended up with 0.7 grams of phosphorus from 10 match boxes and this is kind of disappointing. I will need more red phosphorus than this for the next step and for this reason I am going to use this jar of bought phosphorus. To make the chlorinating agent I am going to use red phosphorus, TCCA, hydrochloric acid and anhydrous calcium chloride to dry the resulting chlorine gas in a special way. I am lazier than you can imagine and instead of setting up an appropriate gas washing bottle, a new invention called the hose adapter gas drying stopper will be employed. Once I set up the special drying thing, I weighed out 15 grams of red phosphorus. Red phosphorus has a weird smell. I can't describe it, but once you smell it, you're never going to forget it. I put the 15 grams of this highly flammable element into a reaction tube and then weighed out 150 grams of TCCA. TCCA stands for trichloroisocyanuric acid. In combination with hydrochloric acid, it will liberate chlorine gas in our chlorine generator. I successfully circumvented one washing bottle, but can't do without another one. As long as I am using an excess of chlorine, whatever is not consumed by the reaction needs to be neutralized somehow. A washing bottle with sodium hydroxide solution is going to absorb most of it. Obviously, I still need to add hydrochloric acid to the chlorine generator. After making sure that the valve of the addition funnel was closed, I added 100 milliliters. 210 milliliters will be required in total. I flushed the apparatus with argon to get rid of any air. Air leftovers can react with the phosphorus, forming phosphorus pentoxide and thereby reducing the yields. This argon step is likely overkill though. Now that I greased all the joints, let me generate funny yellow and highly toxic chlorine gas. When the HCl drop hits the TCCA, you immediately get gas generation. The chemicals react, forming cyanuric acid and chlorine. Out of convenience, I used red phosphorus and not the white allotrope. This reaction needs to be kickstarted if you use red phosphorus and I used the heat gun. The white vapor indicates that the reaction started. It is a mix of phosphorus tri and pentachloride. 
Phosphorus trichloride is a liquid and it's condensed on the cold wall of the glass tube. As I gradually ramped up the chlorine flow, I only got the pentachloride though. With an excess of chlorine, this PCl3 will be chlorinated to PCl5 later on, so there's no need to worry. In the dark, an eerie red glow of this oxygen-free combustion becomes visible. The reaction needs to be heated continuously. PCl5 covers the surface of the phosphorus and if I don't sublime it off, the reaction will not continue. The resulting product is a white powder with a hint of yellow, but that yellow could also be from the chlorine gas and it's only white. I ended up having to heat the tube for more than half an hour, which was longer than expected. A worthwhile yield should be worth the wait though. At some point all HCl had been added. After this event I heated all parts of the equipment to get the PCL5 into the collection flask. I ended up with 75.8 grams of product, that's a 73% yield. The PCL5 will be used as it is and I am going to use 18 grams of oxalic acid. I made sure that it's really fine and you are going to see why in a few seconds. I filled the oxalic acid into a very special piece of laboratory equipment that I've never used before myself. This is a powder addition funnel. You can see that it has this spiral thing and if you turn the knob, you can slowly push the powder into the apparatus. This reaction is going to produce HCl. Another sodium hydroxide gas trap is advisable. As I never tried this before, I decided to use some free cooling because I didn't know if it would get hot. I set up the cooling bath and then slowly turned the knob to push in the oxalic acid. I gotta say, I'm fascinated by this piece of equipment. So simple, yet so useful. The reaction is pretty harmless as it turns out. I wouldn't even have needed the powder addition funnel. Two days later, when it got warmer, I observed bubbling in the washing bottle. Oxalic acid reacts with PCl5 to form oxalic chloride. Another side product besides HCl is phosphoryl chloride. Phosphoryl chloride, despite being highly toxic, is actually worth recovering for me, so I'll see what I can do. For anybody of you who wants to know, here's the reaction mechanism. Keep in mind that oxalic acid is a diacid, so it happens twice in our case. It took 5 days until the reaction was done. The end is indicated by the contents of the flask fully or nearly fully liquefying. I then set up a fractional distillation with a fancy column and then slowly raise the heat of the water bath. I brought the water bath to a boil and even isolated it in aluminium foil, but it was not hot enough. So instead of waiting any longer without anything ever happening, I switched out the water bath for a heating mantle. I turned it on, waited a few minutes and the oxalic chloride started boiling nicely. First drops of our beautiful oxalic chloride came over and, as to be expected, it's a clear and angry liquid. The boiling point of the product is 63 degrees Celsius while phosphoryl chloride boils at 106 degrees C. The millisecond the temperature rose above our target, heating was turned off and I weighed out the oxal chloride. I ended up with 17.7 .7 grams of product and this represents a yield of 69.8%. A fun fact about oxal chloride is that when you heat it enough, you get carbon monoxide and even worse, phosgene. In this step, we are going to chlorinate the phenol. To chlorinate it, I first began by adding water and hydrochloric acid to the phenol we made earlier. I was terribly afraid of losing the product due to suckback, so I added this flask. If suckback occurred, I would have to do this all over again. If there's an under pressure, the liquid will go through the tube into this flask but won't get sucked into the chlorine generator. I set the temperature of the water bath to 45 degrees celsius and then added HCl to make chlorine. I am going to bubble chlorine into this white mess for 3 hours before raising the temperature. It was relatively boring and there was no noticeable change. I raised the temp to 70 degrees celsius. At this temperature, even most of the chlorinated phenol should stay liquid and this is important. I could observe that all of the chlorine was used up in the beginning of the reaction as there was no color in the reaction flask. However, as the reaction proceeded, I got color in the reaction flask and even those nice little crystals growing on the wall of the flask. This is already trichlorophenol. In this reaction, phenol reacts with chlorine to form hydrochloric acid and mainly 246 trichlorophenol. After 10 hours, I stopped the chlorination as the glass tube clogged up. While cooling, these crystals formed. The next day I continued with the chlorination 
as this TLC showed two spots instead of one. Careful temperature control is crucial during the chlorination. If I heat it up too much, I could end up with unprecedented amounts of polychlorinated dibenzodioxins and dibenzofuranes. These chemicals are highly toxic, carcinogenic and you want to avoid making them at all cost. The chlorination ended up taking a little over 26 hours and I got this orange solution of crystals. Despite the intense orange color, trichlorophenol is poorly soluble in water and we mainly got hydrochloric acid. For this reason I just got rid of that nasty orange water. To purify TCP I need to recrystallize it. It is soluble in hot water but solvents like acetone or ethanol are more suitable for enormous amounts. I ended up using water anyways as there is leftover hydrochloric acid and as water is the safest option. As it cooled down crystals crashed out and as the vacuum pump is dead I am now forced to do a normal filtration. The product is not as orange as before and this is a good sign. I got 0.7 grams of very fluffy and slightly yellow product. Let's hope the other recrystallization is better. For the massive chunk which was left over I decided to use a mixture of ethanol and water to increase the solubility. From this recrystallization I got 2 grams of not so clean looking product. I combined the waste with water to crash out the rest of the product and got 40 grams of this trichlorophenol. This was recrystallized from acetone and I ended up with 6.2 grams of clean looking product. It may not be a lot but I am only doing this as a proof of concept anyways. In total I got 8.9 grams of product and this represents a yield of 8.3%. I am only going to use this product though. To make the TCPO I weighed out 4 grams of this beautiful trichlorophenol and then added toluene. As I ended up not having enough toluene, I also added 50 milliliters of its more carcinogenic brother benzene. Unless you want to create unholy amounts of hydrochloric acid gas, a base is required. I used 3 milliliters of triethylamine. The color of the solution changed from yellow to brown, and all the trichlorophenol ended up dissolving. To this I slowly added 0.87 milliliters of the previously made oxalochloride using the syringe. The solution was stirred for an hour in the ice bath and I got this yellow precipitate. To make sure that the reaction is complete I removed the ice bath and continued stirring for a few more hours. You can see the reaction taking place here. The TCP reacts with oxalochloride to form TCPO and hydrogen chloride. The HCl in return reacts with the triethylamine to form triethyl ammonium chloride. I let it stand until the next day because this way you get bigger crystals that are easier to filter and then I filtered it. The suspension contains the product and triethyl ammonium chloride. To get rid of the triethyl ammonium chloride I did two washes with ethanol. Once dry the yield was 2.17 grams which is about 48%. To make the glow sticks I am going to use the chemicals listed on the screen. I didn't use these exact amounts but a few milligrams more or less don't matter. I began by weighing out the TCPO in this vial and then added sodium acetate. Rhodamine B was used as a fluorescent dye. As a solvent I added about 10 milliliters of ethyl acetate. With ethyl acetate the reaction is only going to last for a few minutes and if I wanted it to last longer I could use diethyl phthalate. I don't have that however and therefore we are going to use ethyl acetate. After mixing it was added to a plastic thing and because there was undissolved solid I washed it over with distilled water. To make an appropriate glow stick I added 12% hydrogen peroxide to this glass vial and sealed it. I put the vial into the plastic container, closed it up and then tried to break it. <laughs> Of course it never works like intended and this is because the only glass tube I had had pretty thick walls. Through shaking I managed to break the thin seal and we got the hydrogen peroxide into the glow stick. The glow sticks may glow very dimly but we got this eerie red glow. I am so happy that it worked as this project took many days. I ramped up the camera exposure and got this nice image. The chemistry behind glow sticks is fascinating. We first get the peroxy acid and then deprotonate it with a base. This weird ring that we get does not explain the chemoluminescence though. 
It is assumed that you get an electrically activated version in combination with an activator that is a fluorescent dye. Before breaking off the video, I would like to thank all of my Patreons, because without you guys, this wouldn't be possible. If you want to become a Patreon too, receive early access to videos and even a few exclusive videos like these, feel free to check the link in the video description.